Good evening and welcome to a series of critical conversations that we are having around health and development uh, in partnership with Scroll by Consulting and Survivors Against TB. Today evening, we are going to be discussing uh, the future of health, not just in India, but across the world as the world grapples with the COVID-19 epidemic. My name is Chapal Mehra and I'm a public health specialist. I work in the area of infectious diseases and health work. But today, my guests uh, this evening are going to be discussing a very critical issue that's facing a lot of us. One that uh, leaves us wondering about how prepared are we to address any crisis, any health crisis, not just in India, but anywhere across the world. Many of us see our health systems and our health uh, uh, approaches uh, seemingly broken, uh, unable to cope, unable to address the challenges that lie before us. And as we do that, we're forced with this question, how much of health systems need to change? Do we need to reinvent them? Do we need to rethink them? Do we need to re-engineer them? And if so, what should be the broad contours of this re-engineering? How should we rethink not just our personal approaches to health, not just our immunity and susceptibility, but also the susceptibility and the vulnerability of populations uh, in our countries, but also across the world? What are our global experiences? And what are our experiences in home in India where caseloads are rising every day, shockingly very high, which we expected, but uh, are we ready to cope? And more importantly, is this not an opportunity to rethink the way we approach health and healthcare? So without further ado, let me introduce my two guests this evening. The first is Jennifer Furin, who teaches at Harvard an old friend and also a fierce, fierce supporter of e equity, access, and so many other issues in health. Uh, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everybody. And uh, one of our uh, more outstanding but also uh, outspoken um, uh, bureaucrats who headed the Ministry of Health in India, who's had a very close relationship with health, but also led the entire uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, new ideas and new approaches in health, uh, Keshav Desi Raju. Um, Hello. Good evening. How are you? Good, thanks. Thank you. Good so, to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I sort of introduced the issue a little bit and said what our contours of our discussions will be today evening. Uh, but uh, let me start by laying out a few hygiene items. I'm going to be asking our guests a few questions, but also our guests will take live questions. So on the scroll, Survivors Against TB or Pi Consulting pages, wherever you are accessing this show, uh, please feel free to send us questions and our experts will try and give you as much uh, guidance on it as they can, provided it is in their area of expertise. And um, let's try and address this issue, which is in front of all of us, the future of health. So Jennifer, let me first come to you. You're uh, in uh, the United States of America. Uh, the country is known to have one of the most technologically advanced uh, health systems in the world. Um, but really, in a sense, uh, the pandemic has changed not just the health system uh, in the USA, but the whole world. The world has changed in a sense. And one of the biggest questions um, before us is how do we address this question of health, not just our personal health, but the health system per se. How does it need to change um, for us to be able to take care of ourselves and our lives better? Yeah, thank you for the question, Chapal. I think, you know, COVID-19 has brought many things into the world, but it's certainly given us the opportunity to be reflective uh, about um, what we need to change. Uh, and I think in the United States, which may indeed be one of the most technologically advanced societies in the world, it's also one of the most unequal 
uh, societies in the world. And I think uh, this is a country that is reeling uh, from COVID-19. Uh, we have the highest number of uh, people living with the disease in the world and the highest number of deaths. And, and that has nothing to do with increased access to testing. It has everything to do with unchecked spread of the disease. And so I think what it shows us is that technology alone is not going to solve the problems, uh, not just with COVID-19, but with health. Um, and it shows us that not only do we need um, to address inequalities in health, for example, having a basic healthcare package for everybody in the country, um, and not just in the US, but globally would be something to me that we have to do uh, in the post COVID period. Um, but it also shows us how socioeconomic status and 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 the way that people are living in an unequal society uh, also needs to be addressed if we want to address the, the major infectious and non infectious disease outbreaks in the world, particularly COVID-19. It hasn't affected everyone equally in the United States and it's people who are poor, uh, people who have um, socioeconomic struggles who are suffering the most. Uh, and <coughs> those issues, we're not going to be able to address COVID-19, even in a country as advanced as the U.S. I mean, thank you so much, because you brought out a lot of issues, technology, our socioeconomic status, the inherent inequalities that exist in society, but also within our health system, privatized health care, which is an underlying theme everywhere, both in India and in the U.S., Keshav, you've headed the Ministry of Health in a sense, uh, and we often look to our bureaucrats for uh, a more uh, sobering and realistic perspective on uh, understanding how the system works. Now, India is so badly affected. There's been a lot of panic. How does healthcare in India uh, change, and what should be our change in the approach to healthcare? You know, I mean, I'm thinking of how everybody has been using these adjectives like broken. This uh, COVID-19 has broken our system. And I keep saying to them, I think it was already pretty overburdened and uh, kind of breaking. So what, what, what do you want, uh, how would you describe it and where do you think it needs to go? Oh, well, thank you, Chapal. Um, there are a lot of questions on that. But I think very simply, uh, the delivery of healthcare, the whole system in India is under-resourced. Mm -hmm. I think we have, if we, if we say it is broken, it is because we have not had the resources to fix it. Uh, and uh, again, we, we are saying this time and time again, uh, inadequate budget, both from the government of India and from the states, uh, and there's a limit to how much one is going to be able to do if you don't have the resources. Now, and it's not just financial resources. I think, I hope later this in this session we will talk about health human resources. Now, who do we need? What categories of persons do we need? Where are they being trained? Are they available for service in government? And those are also very important questions because you... Government always tends to look upon uh, resources as sort of physical infrastructure, new buildings, bigger rooms, more hospital beds. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not looking at more trained people on the ground in locations where you want them. And at a time of crisis, that's the first thing that gives because mm -hmm. you don't have enough people on the ground to handle the crisis. So I think uh, there's a huge number of issues in all this, but the starting point I think needs to be that this is a system which is terribly under-resourced. I mean, I thank you for saying that because I think there were two things that you brought out which I, uh, which I think are critical. One is the lack of resources and one uh, is the lack of human resources in particular because we keep thinking of bigger hospitals and bigger, uh, more technology, but the American example is telling us that more technology is really not the answer. Mm, mm. Sometimes the most fundamental access issues are what, mm. uh, uh, what need to change. I mean, Jennifer, let me take something that uh, Keshav said to you, looking at what he said, what would be the three most important things that you think that the health system needs to do urgently, in mm. a sense? to adapt, because I think the re-engineering will take years. It is also a political process because everybody will make their right noises now. And <coughs> we'll, we'll still be arguing again about health budgets. Uh, so what are the three things that you think need to happen in health systems, uh, maybe globally? Uh, to yeah. 
Yeah, and I do want to reflect a, a little bit on, on one of the important things that Keshav said about human resources. Um, you know, I think we often, when we think about human resources in the healthcare system, we're often focused on doctors and nurses. But I think what I've seen during COVID and in all my work uh, on TB uh, and in other things is it's actually not the doctors and nurses who usually make the system run. Uh, it's often skilled professionals who may not be acknowledged or often paid for their work who are in fact the most vital. Um, it's the ward assistants. It's the people who are cleaning the hospital. Uh, it's the people who are providing food and those types of things. And, and we really need to acknowledge that they are the healthcare heroes. You know, it's not just the doctors and the nurses. Um, acknowledge, pay them, and protect them uh, as much as we would anyone within the healthcare system. Um, you know, in terms of things that need to change rapidly, I think providing free healthcare. Uh, for anybody uh, who comes to the healthcare system is essential. Um, you, you, in the U.S., what we see is that people have been staying home and not coming for services, in part because they've been devastated economically and they can't afford to go to the hospital. And, and this has had a big impact, not only driving some of the transmission of COVID, but in terms of other health indicators as well. So, you know, making sure that you you go to seek healthcare based on how you're feeling, not based on your ability to pay. And I think that's really important. I think the second thing to me is we need to divorce the facts of healthcare and the science from healthcare from the political spinnings that people want to put on healthcare. I don't know how to do that um, because often it's the people in politics who decide the budgets and where resources go. But we've been dismayed and horrified in the United States to see the way the facts of science and the facts of health are being abused and subverted for political purposes. And so, you know, we can't have politicians telling people what's best for their health. And we really need to make sure that's coming from health experts, even if the advice or the the facts aren't necessarily in favor of, of the political climate. Uh, and I do think the third thing is that, um, you know, recognizing that health isn't just about disease and medicine, but all the socioeconomic factors that go into it. So things like rent, you know, people who can't pay their rent and are going to be living on the streets, you know, they're going to be highly exposed to COVID um, and, and, and other, <clears throat> excuse me, other um, diseases. So we, we can't just focus on medicine and biological facts. We absolutely have to address the socioeconomic facts. I have patients right now in South Africa who their families are starving and we're telling them don't go out, stay at home so you don't spread COVID, but they can't make that choice. And so to me, those are the three things we, free healthcare, divorcing from political ambitions and wills, and then making sure that we address socioeconomic needs and their urgent. Yes, I mean, we already have a huge amount of questions. I'm inundated, but I'm going to uh, quickly take so much of what Jennifer has said resonates with the India experience, doesn't it, Keshav? And what were the two, three changes you would like to see? Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, a couple of things earlier, but... Uh, Health is so political in India. I mean, you know, you can have you 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 were in the hot seat. You were trying to make the <laughs> decisions. Couple, it's political, but not in an electoral way. Nobody votes or does yeah. not vote for a candidate because that candidate has either delivered on health care or not. So this is very strange. It doesn't seem to matter during elections, but you're right, of course. It's very important when you're making a political statement. Now, but I think what right now, I think what absolutely most crucially needs to be done is that aid governments need as much money as they can to keep primary health centers and government district hospitals functioning. And this means they need more money. They need money for PPE. They need money for, you know, just to keep the, services, both to COVID patients and more importantly, I think, to non-COVID patients at this time. Across the country, there are reports that non-COVID related ailments, people are simply being turfed out of hospitals hmm. because government has said that a certain number of beds have to be reserved as COVID beds. So the COVID beds are not necessarily taken and non-COVID patients are not being treated. So, I mean, this but this is a reflection of the situation of you know not being well resourced enough. So, in order to get uh, government facilities, either primary health centers or district hospitals, fully functional and able to cope with their loads, they need more money. This is not the time to say, "Oh, is it a centrally sponsored scheme? How much have we given you in the past? Where is your utilization of previous funds?" 
at this time of yeah. crisis the money is needed secondly i think uh they will have to pull in on some sort of lump sum payment basis private doctors uh certainly in the states just to man government facilities uh, you don't if you don't have enough people and new people are not joining government service you simply have to pay and get and get uh, i mean you know when we say private doctors it's not as though all private doctors are not the mega facilities in delhi and elsewhere there are lots of you know one man operations a mbbs doctor sitting in some village with one room he is also you know private is a private doctor and i think the services of people like this need to be pulled in and thirdly uh, i'm glad somebody one of the questions on chat someone has raised the question of ashas i i think people like ashas and anganwadi workers whatever the previous history whatever the story is at this point of time they need to be paid more and kept on the job uh uh they certainly need i mean there are reports from many states that ashas are not being paid i mean this is a terrible situation it's uh, i'm i'm saying not only should they be paid they should be paid more at this point of time and basically remember we are talking about a situation that will go on till the vaccine is available mm-hmm. that may be 12 months and maybe 18 months from now but these well, next 12 to 18 months till mm-hmm. the vaccine is available where it has everybody who you can pull in has to be pulled in and if you need to pay them you pay them there are medium term and long term things to do but i think right now the immediate short term this is the sort of stuff we should be doing i mean i think uh, this is a very important thing that you raised because you know a <laughs> conversation with a vaccine specialist and i sort of pointedly asked him even if he had a vaccine tomorrow there is the question of distribution and administration yep. and our health system is not really set up to do this at scale we you know it's taken us years so i i do want to ask the yeah keshav yeah, you yes to- and no yes and no it's a huge logistic operation but we did do it for polio uh and using entirely different methods we did have a mass program in hiv aids i suspect we have lost those skills within government because i don't even know if naco exists anymore but no, no, it, uh, does. it does exist in some shadow of its past form so we have done these things in the past yes. we have done these things in the past a anm the fully used to the whole immunization drill the cold chain the weekly village health and sanitation day when the babies are uh, vaccinated this is there this is uh, it may not be superbly well functioning but it's pretty good functioning and certainly some states do better than others but right now i suspect all those skills we are losing because we we are saying only covid patients will be treated yeah all those skills in running a huge program like that we are, i we shouldn't lose those so i mean i think i do want to add a couple of things to what keshav said which is that uh, asha's not being prayed is a perennial problem in the states and we've been hearing this for years pre covid and these are the people who were uh, at the grassroots they are actually the foot soldiers in the sense and very wisely as pointed out by both of you they are not necessarily doctors they are not necessarily nurses but they are the real grassroots healthcare workers in a sense I mean one of the questions we've had from Anupama Krishnamurthy is and I think it's a very valuable one I'm going to take it to you first um Jennifer she's saying that reimagining healthcare um in a place like India rather than reimagining uh why can't we go back to basics like creating equitable spaces uh public spaces like schools to start with I think uh, the the question of course is this is actually true for anywhere mm. that time to create equitable spaces where healthcare is available because healthcare is hard to access um, yeah i think it's a it's a really important point and and this issue of equity plagues us in healthcare it it's become very highlighted during the covid pandemic but i think all of us on on this chat uh would agree that equity has been an issue that plagues healthcare and some of that is uh related to quality 
Um, and um, my colleague Madhu Garpai uh, has, is someone who's taught me a lot about quality and services. And I, and I think when we look, even in the US um, and in other countries where I've worked, um, there's, a, there's a quality gap, I think, often, or a perceived quality gap um, between services that are available to people who are poor and services that are available to people who are wealthy. Uh, and so the question is, how, how do we not only make it accessible, but make that quality accessible? And, and I do think that's where some of it comes down to, you know, making sure that everybody has access to a basic healthcare package. Um, you know, that the doctors who are working in the public clinics get the same types of compensation as doctors who are working in private clinics um, and, and that there are other types of incentives to work in public health care um, that it's seen as, a, as, as something prestigious to do, that it's seen as something that's joyful to do. And, and this goes back to what Kishap was saying about resources, right? Why do people not want to work in public health systems and public health spaces? It's often because they don't have the resources to do the things that they need and want to do. I used to work in a very poor country called Lesotho, and we couldn't get any doctors to work in the public health care system because there was no medication available. And one of the doctors said, I didn't go to medical school to become a morgue attendant. Right. So it wasn't about, you know, giving him a pay raise. It was about making sure his hospital was well, well resourced and functioning. And so I think when we talk about creating these public spaces where people have access to things, we also have to address the quality issues. Uh, and sometimes this is very hard to do, especially when it feels like, OK, we just have to do something fast and, and make sure, you know, there's quote unquote access on the map. But we have to make sure that that access looks the same, you know, whether you're living in a slum in Calcutta or you're living in a wealthy, you know, section of Mumbai. It, it can't be different. And I, I don't know how to solve that problem, but I think the first step is being honest about it um, and saying that that's what we're striving for. Because until we do that, we're going to always be plagued that there may, in theory, be access, but we know that access is, is not anything at all what we need. I mean, thank you for highlighting because I think I'm, I'm going to turn to the question that we were asked by Venkatesh, who is uh, who is talking about the fact that when you go to healthcare facilities, they lack water, they lack uh, cleanliness, they lack basic hygiene, and then you're asking us to trust the health system in a sense. But I think the uh, I want to add another question that I have to that issue is that there is the quality of health systems and health services. But before that, there is access to food and even access to things like transport. Because what we are finding in, in India, for instance, is um, that patients have to travel long distances. Keshav knows this better than anyone who's part of the health system. Um, so Keshav, let me ask you to reflect, take something that Jennifer said and take it to you. Um, is this also not a good time to focus on the social determinants of health that we speak so much about and uh, building the capacity of communities to actually prevent disease? Because a lot of these uh, diseases are have social roots, social and economic roots. And, uh, we have yes, Chapal, of course. This is not new. We know this. Yeah. And you know from all your work in TB, we've been yeah. saying this for years and years and years, but uh, we we are simply unable to get our implementation done in good faith. Hmm. We have we have on record, we have on paper, we have very very good policy prescriptions. We have good statements. We have we have, we are good at identifying the problem and saying this is what needs to be done. Nothing ever gets done, uh, either because there are no people, there's no interest, there's a lack of <laughs> lack of good faith. It's done simply for the sake of uh, you know for a, for a statement to be made. Now, a couple of days ago, the government of India has announced something called the National Digital Health Mission. This is a very good document. It's a very good document that tells you exactly how we manage data. Now that's fine. I mean, obviously we need something like this. We need every, every citizen, every person needs to have full and complete access to, you know, to her health status at any time. This is all, this is all very, very good stuff. 
But A, we don't know whether they have the money to do this. And B, this in itself is not going to lead to better health outcomes. You know, yeah. uh, unless we start talking about health outcomes, and just talking about data management, which is what the digital health mission is. Yeah. It's excellent and is certainly needed. Every country needs to have that kind of thing. But we do have more pressing uh, problems. But as I said, basically it is we, we, we always lose out on implementation. Either interest flags at some point or the money fails or it's some other priority, comes, some other crisis comes up. Uh, and again, if I can go back to HIV AIDS, it was one example where we defied all these, these norms, mm -hmm. where interest was not lost, where money continued to come, where separate administrative structures were set up. They were given special administrative dispensations in how they spent their money and how they interacted with state governments. Huge involvement of civil society groups. So we did all this. We did all this in one particular case. But we don't seem able to do it or to think like that in, in you know, more generally. I mean, I think this, this is a very important issue because uh, I think one of the things that it's pointing to is that uh, uh, governments have been are no longer seen as responsible for our health and our health care. And this is this is kind of functioning uh, hits at the uh, basic role of the state. Right. Because if you pay taxes and you live in a country, if there are is taken care of what is so jennifer i'm going to ask you to weigh in on this because as one of the richest countries in the world um, uh, you have this uh, question in america but also you have it in india and so many other countries where private health care has mushroomed way out uh, uh, and outstripped in a sense government's ethical responsibility right and then people are asking in us in this pandemic what is the government doing hmm. um but the solutions we are all looking at are also some of them private sector led. So how can we re-engineer this relationship with the private sector, A? And uh, the second question that I want to ask is, can why doesn't health become a political issue? We're mm -hmm. willing to vote for roads. We are willing to vote for uh, um, you know computers, but we don't seem to be willing to uh, what for access to health? Hmm. Yeah, it's it's a great question, Chapal, and it's a very timely question for those of us here in the U.S. I think part of the reason that people aren't willing to vote for healthcare is because they ultimately see healthcare as the responsibility of the individual. Um, I think we've so. Um, you know, we've made health so biological um, and, and we've removed it from the social that, you know, my health doesn't seem to be connected to my neighbor's health or connected to what's going on in my state or my country and certainly not my world, right? I mean, look at what's happening. This is a global pandemic and what's been happening, every single nation has become much more, you know, na nationalized, right? The vaccine, I'm buying it for my people. You know, I'm withdrawing from the WHO and, and the US has been by far the worst country in, in regards to this. So I think because we don't view health as a collective, uh, we view health as an individual responsibility um, that, that we don't vote that way. And I think that that is a great disservice that's been done with, you know, sort of the biomedical approach to healthcare. Uh, and I think until people understand more that my health is a determinant of what's going on in the society around me, uh, we're not going to see people voting for health. It's it, in the, it's always the economy, right? But the economy drives health, right? Poor people are much more likely to have certain health problems and lack of access to health care. You just look at COVID in the US, again, a, a very technologically advanced country, a very wealthy country, a very unequal country. Who's dying of COVID? It's poor people. There's racism involved in it because it's people of color who are dying, right? And, and, and yet people want to deny these facts and keep health focused on the biological because then it's like, well, if I go to the right doctor and get the right diagnosis and get the right pill, it's done. It's a solved problem. And it's not. It's not at all. Um, the privatization issue, it's a really tough one. And I have to say in the US, we're certainly not a model for how to, to do privatization correctly. I mean, we're looking in my country, if you live in Navajo Nation, for example, where indigenous people were rounded up and forced to live, you cannot get a COVID test. Right. And if you do, it's going to take 14 days to get it back. If you are an NBA basketball player, 
you get a COVID test every single day so that you can go out on the court and play basketball, right? So, so what is that about? That's a private health system, run amok, run amok. And so again, I think it's really the, the issue is that because we view health as an individual thing, we think, okay, it's not our problem together. And I don't think further privatization of healthcare is the answer. I think recognizing health as a collective is the answer and moving away from these grossly unequal systems. They, and there's a lot of myths about them that are driven by rich people. Well, if you if you have a public health system, you won't get the good science. There'll be death panels, all these things. But they're myths. They're lies. They're lies that are perpetuated so wealthy people can still get better care. And again, to me, I don't know how to fix it, but I know we have to be honest about it. No, I think, thank you. Thank you for telling us some home truths, yeah. because I think this, this conversation would be incomplete without them. And that's why, Keshav, I have to turn to you because this is your cue. All of this is true in India, isn't it? And how, how are we going to deal with this? Because we, are, we, are, we moved rapidly towards privatization. Now we are privatizing so many things. And um, what should we be doing? Uh, I mean, you know, that was one of the questions actually I had. And uh, Jen brought it in. Yeah. This is not a short term thing. This is going to take time to unravel. And I would really sort of date this to the early 90s when we privatized medical education. Mm -hmm. It was when we made it easy for private medical colleges, so much so that today I think there are about 450 medical colleges in India, well over 60% of them are private. Now, uh, a huge number of people paying enormous fees to get educated in a private college are getting employment in private hospitals that pay very large salaries, which then make the, 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 the patients pay in order. So the whole system, it all began with that. So this has to be, we have to, this has to go back. We have to, to, to go back to what I was saying earlier about health, human resources. I think on the slightly longer term, we, every state will need to assess what are my requirements, not just of doctors and super specialists, but of nurses, of allied health professionals, of uh, health, public health workers, you know, ASHAs, vaccinators, midwives, the whole range of, in fact, there is a bill pending in parliament on, to regulate the training and appointment of allied health professionals, or we know what is to be done. We start need to doing that in the public sector again. All of Uttar Pradesh, which is India's largest state, I think has 10 government medical colleges. I mean, that is, that is a very, very bad position. Some states are good. Tamil Nadu possibly has a government medical college in every district. Uh, and it, it varies between states. But unless we start training people at affordable fees at all levels of health workers, allied health people, nurses, doctors, super specialists, uh, we are not going to be able to achieve universal health care through the public system. If I want all my, my basic requirement is of one halfway competent MBBS doctor in every primary health center in the country. I'm not going to be able to meet that unless I begin producing them coming out of government medical colleges. And other things will need to be done. HR people will need to weigh in on how do I, yeah, much of India, large parts of India, rural India, difficult areas, far away, not easy to get to, no schools. No doctor wants to go and work there. So they need, we need to figure out a way in which you can get doctors to serve there. A brief tenures if necessary, but so long as there's always somebody there. Those are the kind of things we need to be thinking about. Now, there are many things we should be thinking about, but this, I think, is one very important one of how do we, how many trained persons do we want 15 years from now? And what are we going to do to get them? How state-wise, where do I want them? I want them in the different states. And states should be encouraged to do it and set up training facilities. Technology is an enormous help in this. It's, you don't necessarily need 
you know, a built up building, which used to be the thinking earlier, but it, it can be done if you put your mind to it. And, you know, government is quite good at, you know, missions when it undertakes them. If it, if it were to undertake a mission like this, we we're going to train nurses and allied health workers for every state. And, you know, so many people will be trained in quality institutions. It's not going to help today's situation, but 10 years from now, it may mean that we are much better prepared to handle the crisis. I mean, I think uh, uh, with that, I, I do want to say if there's a government official listening in, I think you have the next chairman for the medical training uh, uh, commission, if there is one, because he's very articulately just laid out the plan. But uh, uh, I mean, some of the things that you said, Keshav, let me take them to you, uh, Jen. Um, this question of skills. I mean, uh, Keshav said it very clearly that you need to be mm. building skills in a way which serve you for the next 10 to 15 years and you need to be doing it now. I mean, in the middle of the pandemic, we're not going to find people and mm. train them. Uh, and uh, health systems across the world are guilty of this, right? We are always short starved. Um, we do not pay our ashas or our frontline health workers enough. In India, a lot of them are not even permanent, the ones that get hired. So, uh, and I know because I go and work in the States and the first thing when I'm uh, doing meetings with the frontline health workers and I ask them this question, uh, what are your problems? And they're like, we haven't been paid for three months. Hmm. That is our biggest problem. The terrain is not the problem. The commitment is not the problem. Their relationship with the patient is not the problem. But the fact that they do all the work and it doesn't get paid. So how do we solve the skill question? Because we we want we basically want uh, we, uh, we want to use uh, 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 all these people stop gap arrangements for for a public good that should be invested in. Yeah. in yeah, it's a great question. And I think, you know, the, the quick answer to that is we have to professionalize and pay the frontline workers. I mean, it's, you know, I, I can't tell you even now the number of times I sit in meetings where people talk about using community health volunteers. It's always volunteers. And, and, and I might point out they're almost always women, right? They're almost always women. Um, who are expected to be these community health volunteers. And, and it's because of this myth, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a classist myth, it's a colonial myth that's been passed down that to train and pay these people, we don't have enough money, right? We don't have enough money. And, and we have to stop that. You know, I was really, um, the idea of having public medical schools to me here in the US, it's a great idea. You know, most people come out of their medical training um, owing, close to a million dollars in the United States. That is not an exaggeration. And so doctors feel justified, justified, you know, charging these large amounts of money. And I don't know, I'm a healthcare professional. I'm a physician. I did spend a lot of time going to school, but I don't think the work that I do is any more or less important than the work a community health worker does. It's just different. Right, it's just different. But because I spent all this money going to medical school um, and there's a classist element to it, we do feel justified saying, well, no, no, if there's a grant, you know, or we're asking for funding for a hospital, nobody ever asked the doctors to volunteer, right? It's always the frontline people. So I think committing to professionalizing them, recognizing them as a cadre of workers and paying them and making their payment be key is absolutely essential to this. But I think we have been so focused on, on being doctor heavy. Um, and, and I think we have to stop that. Um, but you know, even in the US, for example, we had to do a lot of work um, with trying to get community health workers during COVID to do the most challenging job to go to the households to do the contact tracing and assessments. And people still want to talk about them as being volunteers. So the cost to the system by asking people to volunteer um, is much greater in the long term. Um, and so that to me is something, it's, a, it's an easy answer. Yes, we need training facilities for everybody that are more equal and don't cost an arm and a leg, but the frontline workers should be prioritized over the tertiary workers any day, if you ask me. Okay, so you wanted to I thank you, Jen. You wanted I to add that's an extremely good point that Jennifer just made, but I have just one more take. You know, the community workers business now, you and I living in our apartment blocks in the big cities, we would never think of 
community system. We would never volunteer even for any community yeah. work. Yeah. It's always, it's, community work always comes up when we talk about rural India. It's somebody else out there. They're the ones who are supposed to do community work. They're the ones who are supposed to do community mobilization. I am never going to do it. I think there's also, we need to rethink this. We need to, we need to, I mean, why, why would, you can't have a policy that lays down that you get someone else to do something that you're not going to do yourself. I think we, we need to think more about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, there there are uh, there are obvious lessons here because there is the, this this community health worker and community health volunteer, and I keep hearing uh, other essential services, uh, sanitation workers in India and other uh, uh, other workers, where we keep talking about them as being impermanent, as being uh, often non-critical, and somehow their work is looked down upon. And it, this pandemic is making us realize that our jobs may not be that critical, but their jobs are. They're the ones that keep our cities and our country functioning without things uh, getting stopped, even in the middle of this pandemic. I want to quickly turn to this question, uh, because I think in the US and in India, this is critical, this is asked by Washita. She's saying, what's the role of communications in reimagining the health system? Looking at the US, there's a very strong anti-mask sentiment how does one deal with this kind of misinformation and sentiments? I mean, I think communication, I always say, has been, and, and I wrote about this in the Hindu, has been the biggest casualty in the pandemic. And it, we have created panic and we have created confusion. And uh, Jane, if you can reflect a little bit, because this is a question based in the US, and then I'll take it to Keisha. Yeah, you know, I think. Um Part of the problem is that we assume communication occurs in a vacuum, right? Whereas every message that's sent and received comes from a person who has already a highly developed belief system, right? And, and I think that's part of the problem is that if I'm in the US and I believe that the government is out to get me uh, and they don't want me to have my freedoms and rights, when they tell me to wear a mask, this isn't a health issue. This is my perception that no, you know, I don't trust you and what you're telling me is wrong. If I believe in science and I trust the medical community when, you know, the head doctor in the US, Tony Fauci says you need to wear a mask, I'm going to wear it, right? But a lot of that is shaped historically, you know, we working on the front lines COVID here in the US, I saw two groups of people who didn't believe in COVID. Okay, one group of people were avid right-wing Donald Trump supporters who felt like this whole thing was manufactured during an election year to get him, which is a very strange to me. But the other group of people were people who were largely poor inner city African Americans who'd been completely screwed over by the health system for decades, for decades, who'd been experimented upon without their permission, um, you know, who, who really um, have a, a great mistrust based on good grounds. And so the communication approaches to those two different groups of people need to be very different. And I think sometimes we forget the history, we forget the context, and we think there should be one message that always needs to go out there. Um, but I think, you know, it, it, it again shows how political health is and how it, we just, it, we can't divorce the medical facts from the political and economic reality in which they take place. So thinking about how to tailor these things to speak to people on the points that are meaningful to them becomes important. Um, thank you so much, Jen. But I, I'm, I'm going to take the same question to you, Keshav, because I feel like in India, uh, we've sort of failed. Well, uh, I think Jennifer was spot on and everything she said. It's a question of credibility. Hmm. If the government lacks credibility, hmm. uh, and the, or the person conveying the message is somebody the people do not trust, they're not going to listen to him. You know, if if the medical officer in charge of the primary health center appears only once a month to collect his salary, mm. they're not going to listen to him if he suddenly appears and says, wear masks, do this, vaccinate your children. It's, uh, but again, the counter to that is, uh, if technology can be misused, but technology can also be used. So I think a lot depends on, you know, people, maybe even civil society groups that work in the health area should, who, who carry credibility in their own regions if nowhere else, 
uh, these are the kind of people who really should work on uh, you know these no mask kind of groups uh, uh, we've seen this you know uh, a lot of people who didn't want um, polio not a lot but certainly some who didn't want their children vaccinated for polio but it was possible to get over that by you know building up a team of people who were trusted hmm. and i think uh, uh, thank you for making that point keshav because i i just want to say that there, there were people who didn't believe in wearing uh, uh, getting their children vaccinated for polio in india we also had a long history of people who didn't believe they need didn't need to wear condoms and i want yes. to bring that up again and again because i think uh, keshav quoted that very well saying that we we did manage to do that in hiv so i mean i think the co communication around the science and of course around the disease should have been more nuanced and carefully thought out and well planned i mean that also brings me to this question of science and uh, we keep harboring you know i mean there's been so much panic in the media first there was the cure then there was remdesivir then there were the hiv drugs um um and now the vaccine and you know the vaccine uh, the oxford vaccine the moderna vaccine we everybody in india talks and elsewhere in the world i'm told talks about the vaccine like nothing else matters in covid um but uh, jen let me ask you because you you have a broader uh, um social perspective the vaccine what is its role and uh, and you know i mean why are we making it to be the ultimate solution at the end yeah i think the short answer to that chapal is desperation right <laughs> I think we we are all looking for the magic answer to stop this mess. Um, I think that you know the world has sort of been brought to its knees by COVID in a way I don't think any of us have ever seen before. Um, and so we want a magic answer, and and we've gone through some of those magic answers, right? Chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, you know, being outside yeah. when the in the U.S. it was when the summer comes this won't be a problem anymore, right? And it didn't happen that way. And so I think we all want a magic simple answer because then we can go on about our lives, we can go back to the way things were before. Um and so I think that's what it is. It's a magic answer. It's a, a hope we have that one thing will save us. But but we know that one thing isn't going to save us. We know that. And and so we're going to be forced even if there is a vaccine that comes out to address these complex issues. And it's hard. It's human beings we want something simple right and so how do we go against our nature or grow in our in our nature uh to move away from something simple to something that's more complex but but i think much more beautiful and much more effective and this even with the vaccine it gets us back to the issue we were talking about about the ashas and the frontline workers right information is better given by people who are trusted how do you become mm -hmm. trusted you become trusted by being present and by That's behaving true. by behaving in a trustworthy fashion those are the two things right and so yeah. if we don't prioritize the people from the communities who are present and behave in a trustworthy fashion and professionalize yeah. them uh, it's never going to work even if we have a vaccine even if it's the best vaccine in the whole world and so i think we come back to these basic principles that frontline workers have to be the people who are prioritized paid yeah. and given responsibility in this and with responsibility has to come um funds not just to pay them but so they have the things they need to do quality work and it's going to be the same with the vaccine there's no simple answer to this there never was one um kish do you want to weigh in on that because you administered a whole oh, system she, she she she's absolutely correct it's a uh, uh frontline workers are are not being treated well every sort of story is coming out no protective equipment stigmatized where they live impossible hours of work not not being paid on time it's all this is true and uh, and uh, we will have to ensure when the vaccine is finally available that they are the first in line in fact uh, that has to be done and i, I think in, uh, the government's uh, credibility is online really at this point you know, will they ensure that the frontline workers are the ones who first receive the vaccine when it is finally available my hunch is they won't be but let you can always hope yeah well i mean i think it's an important point to raise uh, mm -hmm. because they are and i think this is how one builds political will i want to say we are in the last 10 minutes of the program and i do want to say to people we have a few questions of people who have more questions 
please do ask them. Our experts will try and address them for you. I think a very interesting question. Uh, sorry, Kesha, you wanted to say something. No, no, no. Yeah. Tell us the question. Tell yeah. us the question. No, so yeah. I, yeah, yeah. So I think a very uh, interesting question has emerged is um, what is at the community level, what is the role of community health systems and community based health systems and community led health? Uh, programs, because I think um, uh, uh, sort of looking at the community action model and things like that. And India always spoke about how the community is so integrated, but also elsewhere. Um, how do we address this? Jen, first you and then uh, uh, Keshav, you briefly, because both of you have worked in these systems. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we have to do more than just pay lip service to it. Um, I think that, um, you know, the community driven solutions involve actually letting the communities have a leading role, giving them the resources they need, both financial and human. Um, but so often now, it's like a buzzword. It's like human rights, community driven solutions, community health workers for communities. But we say this, but then people don't actually do it, right? So again, coming back to the US, you know, millions and millions of dollars are given to these companies, hundreds of millions of dollars to develop vaccines. Um, but nobody is giving hundreds of millions of dollars to community frontline workers or even listening to their needs. And so, you know, in some ways, I'm a little embarrassed to be sitting here with you as a doctor um, who works at a hospital, what I'd really like to say is I can't answer this question for you, but I know some people who live in the community where I work who, who probably could answer the question for you in a better way. And, you know, until those voices are the most important voices driving this, I, I don't know that we're going to get anywhere, but I think we have to move beyond the lip service of, of the community. Um, so that, that's my answer to it. No, no, I think that's a very, very honest and a very useful answer. Bishop. What do you that's think? Not, that's absolutely correct. We have to pay up, you know, put our money where our mouth is, as they say, and uh, pay more attention to the identification and training uh, of the mentorship of community workers, their pay. In fact, I was just looking at something on Twitter. You know, Vikram Patel has just put out something saying that, you know, it's essential to have community level mental health you know, workers. Absolutely correct. But then these people need to be as I said, identified, trained, uh, and, you know, respect. Respect is very important. It's, it can't just be, oh, you know, currently the thinking is a job needs to be done, oh, the ASHA will do it. I mean, that is not respectful. And I think that is something we need to work on. It doesn't come easily to us in our hierarchy-based system. You know, to respect someone who's below you in the hierarchy is not something that comes easily to most people here. But that's something we have to learn. And I think not anywhere, but uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, uh, this one of the things that this pandemic is showing us is how insignificant we are, even though we okay. may be higher in the imaginary food chain, and how significant to our lives also other people are, uh, whatever the jobs or whatever the small tasks that they do. I think a question specifically has come from the US for you, um, and I want you to address it, Jen which is that the United States is struggling to re-engineer its health healthcare system. What considerations from the conference should our president keep in mind during this process? I, I don't know which conference. I, I thought maybe this discussion is what uh, Jane Hardy is referring to. Um, what would you suggest? Yeah, you know, I think the U.S., um, you know, now you'll see some of my political leanings in here. The U.S., the whole healthcare system is based on the whole system of the country, which is that capitalism will save us, right? That 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 money, you know, will save us, <laughs> um, and that a market-driven approach to healthcare is what we need. And and it's not true, and it isn't working. So I think you know we have to keep in mind that we can't take a market-driven approach to healthcare anymore. It's just. It, it isn't something that's going to work out. And the idea even of these trickle down economics, that things will get down to the people that they need to get down to, it just doesn't work. And so I actually think we need to start rebuilding from the ground up. Um, and I think there are some good examples out there of how, you know, non-market driven health systems can be successful. I think if we look at Canada uh, as an example, um, you, yes, if you're 95, you may not get, you know, a, a colon cancer resection and put in the ICU for three weeks 
weeks. But, you know, we do have to make some decisions um, about uh, equality and equity in healthcare. But I think we need to restart. And I think it needs to start from the ground up. And and the last thing I'll say, and then I promise I'm going to stop talking because I know we're at the end, is we, we do also need to include the voice of the COVID affected communities in some of these conversations. Uh, I think we learned well in HIV that when the affected communities were able to share some of their voices and concerns, we did a better job when we listened to them. So it doesn't answer the question about rebuilding the healthcare system, but I do think uh, making sure that people um, who have been affected by this disease in many ways also have a say in, in not just how we restructure COVID care, but in how we restructure our healthcare systems to begin with. So thank you. No, no, thank you so much, because I think that's the perfect point to start ending. We have exactly two minutes. I'm going to ask each of you to reflect for a minute, because I think there's a lot we have learned from both your inputs, both from the equity perspective and the systems perspective, but also from the uh, community and the investment perspective. But Keshav, I'm going to take this question to you. What should our prime minister learn from this epidemic? What would you? What would be the top three things you would say to him that he should do for healthcare in this country? All our leadership. I mean, not just him, but all our leadership in a sense, state, national. What would you say? Well, in the immediate short term, more money. Secondly, go back to our commitment to universal healthcare. What does it require you to do? It's fairly straightforward. And can we, in a system, a systematic basis over the next five years, ten years, plan for that? And thirdly, what I was talking about earlier about medical education being an essential part of healthcare services altogether. However, Chapel, with your permission, I just want to say one more thing. There's one issue that we have not spoken about at all in today's session, which is the children of India have had, suffered enormously during this time. Infants have lost out on vaccinations. Children going to ICDS centers have not gone. They have lost out on supplementary nutrition. Yes. Six to 14 have lost out on midday meals and in whatever schooling they were getting. Yes, effectively, absolutely. effectively, the whole year has gone for, you know, several cohorts. 26 million babies are born in India every year. So if you look at the pop population between zero and 14, I mean, that's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of Indians, children. No one is saying enough. People in their own spheres are talking about it. But that, how do we make up what these children have lost, whether it is in preventive health care, whether it is in nutrition, whether it is in schooling, whether it is in socialization. This is something that's going to take a lot of our time in, in the post-COVID period. No, I think, I think that's a very sobering note to end on because mm. I think both of you have actually laid out what our leaders should be doing in a sense going forward. And I think these are issues that are critical to consider. So thank you both for thank joining you. this evening. Thank and you very thank much. You. I enjoyed that. And thank I, you. And we'll, thank, thank you. you. And we'll